Hello and welcome again. This is Joey Myers, your host from HittingPerformanceLab.com and from EffectiveVelocity.com. Perry Husband for our part two, where we're going to be talking about the hitting guru number 57, I like to call him, who said that <laughs> uh, if your instructor is teaching mechanics or teaching based on exit velocity, increasing exit velocity, ask him why. And it wasn't said in a nice tone of, yeah, just ask your instructor uh, just <laughs> why they, you know, it was, it was a very um, mocking way of doing things like, why are you doing it? What, what's wrong with you type of type of context. So we're going to do our part two, which are part one. I'll have a link in the video of this blog post, probably somewhere below this video. Um, but I wanted to bring Perry on again, because he's got some sh a video sharing stuff he wants to he wants to talk about that that he he got ready, got everything ready for in the part one, but we just we had so much to talk about in part one, that uh, we want to do part two. So Perry, welcome to the welcome to the show. First of all, thank you. It's uh, <laughs> welcome back. Always, always fun. I love these actually. I, if I, I could do these every day, I think this is probably where I'm going to go next in my world uh -huh. is, is doing these kinds of things. Cause I, I really like them. Yeah. It's, it's very fun. Very, very, uh, it's nice to know those out there are probably listening to this or watching this or reading, reading it. Uh, it's nice to know that you have others out there that are thinking like you, or at least asking the same kind of questions, right. That you're not, in I've had pro teams reach out to me saying, Hey, I heard you on such and such a podcast. What are you talking about? Like, are you serious? <laughs> these and, are pro, and these are yeah, pro guys. They, like, yeah. these are pro guys and teams. Multiple that's times happened. that's happened. Yeah, so more, it makes you wonder. More than, yeah, at least three times that's happened. Where, like, a, a hitting guy or a pitching guy or uh, a front office guy will reach mm -hmm. out and say, "Okay, I heard this. Sounds a little out there. Mm -hmm. Explain it to me." Mm -hmm. and, it, and as soon as you explain it to them, they're like. Man, that is nothing like what I thought effective velocity was. <laughs> That's so so odd. <laughs> yeah, and I I think it's just uh, and we'll get into it here in a second, but I think part of the uphill ballot, uh, battle, the the challenge that we're running into that you're you've been running into for for a few decades now uh, that you've been doing the research on this is the fact that the education of learning it and the system and things it's easier for somebody to see a bunch of videos on tiktok and instagram and see all these goofy ugly weird looking drills and to say wow this guy worked with so-and-so in the big leagues uh he's doing these weird drills yeah these dr drills are weird but maybe there's something to it and maybe we'd try it because so-and-so is working yeah. working on it right and instead of Something like what you and since we met and talked at Anaheim ABCA uh, coaching, I mean, I I completely uh, buy into it. I probably don't understand it. Like you said, I'm not a black belt or I'm not probably even a red belt or anything like that. But I understand it pretty, pretty well. And I remember the first time I. Like, what are my hitters going to do if they run into this? And, um, you know, blessing and a curse. It's such a great system. And I think we talked the other day and how competition I think people that get it don't want to let it out. And um, yeah. you and I, we both want to get it out there because we want to see baseball get better, right? We yeah. want to see pitchers get better. And then in in turn, hitters have to get better. So, to, you know, to kind of go from there, Perry. Well, there's so much to cover in this. And I, and I hate that we don't have enough time typically. But um, one of the things that gets lost in this and, and the way the reason that I say like white belt and black belt is because, again, if you and I are playing chess and we don't know how to really play, but we just move the horsey where it's supposed to go and we move the, you know, because you can, because I know how that piece works. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you and I could ever predict who's going to win because you're going to make a bunch of great, awful and good and all the everything in between kind of moves. And so am I. But neither one of us know what good is or bad. Mm -hmm. So we continue to make them over and over and over and over and over. Right now, the state of pitching in baseball and softball is that people are so fascinated by spin and movement and velocity that they throw random horsey pieces all over the place, right? So there's no way to predict what's going to happen. That's why all the analytics people say that pitch sequencing is just an art that has nothing to do with with science but the reality is is that it's 100 science it's actually every single bit of it is measurable predictable 
And and that's why Oklahoma on the on the pitching side went stupid. They just went, they started attacking and using moves that wasn't just moving the horsey. They're moving the horsey in a very strategic way, only when it meant only when it was at the right time. So sequencing is really about avoiding 100, 100. It's not about trying to get ground balls or, or anything like that. So that's one of those weird things that happens is that there's so much that can work. Any idiotic method of hitting will work if the guy on the mound and the guy behind the plate calling pitches is a white belt. If mm-hmm. they just mix pitches and throw them all over the place, if they throw this and this, this and this all day, even though this is great and this is great, both of those pitches are great. Guess what? They're both visible. And mm-hmm. so a higher level hitter or even a novice hitter is going to see it and adjust to it. But what what guys are doing when they're great is they're throwing pitches where they look the same and then boom, one goes this way and one goes this way, but they're splitting in a way that's strategic and scientific. Mm-hmm. They're going away from the barrel, not into the barrel. A lot of guys are doing this and they're throwing they're throwing right directly into the barrel, both pitches. Mm-hmm. So they're creating a tunnel and both pitches are heading to the exact reaction time of one barrel path. So well, good example. Well, good example. Before you go on on that, Perry. Good example is last night I was watching my, my uh, boy Noah, my ten year old. We were watching a Padres Marlins game, and I can't remember who was pitching because they both were kind of doing the same thing. The pitchers, but they had a guy throwing ninety four to ninety six fastball, and he throws a hard one. Um, I think it was just off the off the plate outside, and an umpire calls it a strike, and then throws another one in that bottom. Uh, so it's a righty hitter. So bottom bottom left corner, another one, same pitch, and then throws another one that's just kind of over uh, a little bit and you know you get a swing and you got a swing and miss i think on the first one a foul back on the second one and then the third one the hitter just pops it up to right and and i told Noah, i go man he was lucky that pitcher was super lucky because every pitch was the same pitch yeah and he ends he get he gets a pop up to right like he's lucky that he wasn't hunting that way and smashed the second one he's lucky the hitter was a white belt and had an uppercut swing that matched this philosophy that we're talking about right because um, if you're going to get four or five fastballs in the same sequence that all match this or a fastball in three sliders or cutter or split, but they all match this bat path, how hard is it to hit? You know what I mean? Like any philosophy will work. Mm-hmm. The, the question I have and always the way that I look at it, like when I'm working with a pitching or pitcher or a pitching staff and you're, I'm looking at opposing hitters. The question is, is not, can these guys hit? Of course they can hit when everything's perfect. Mm -hmm. When you feed me perfect, I'm the greatest double play turner in the world. Mm -hmm. But the guy, the question is, is can you turn it when it's a terrible throw? Mm -hmm. Right. Can it, can I hit pitches that are very difficult to hit? So in other words, I look at the, the hitter and go, does he hit effective velocity sequences? And the answer is always no, not no, but hell no. They're not Mm -hmm. even close. They do not handle fastballs up and in, although they can. And I, at times when the sequence is fastball in, fastball in, fastball in, fastball middle in, they'll hit the middle in ball out of the yard. Mm-hmm. Or if it's the third at bat and I've pounded you inside with fastballs in, fastballs in, fastballs in, and then you finally make an adjustment and and sit on a pitch, that that's that's when they hit it. But when when sequences are thrown where the fastball runs up and in, Slider runs away, change up runs down. Nobody hits that. Mm-hmm. Nobody. I mean, it, maybe you watched the game last night with the ass or with the uh, Diamondbacks and and the best hitting team in baseball, one of them. And they were stymied for a long time. Both teams actually, because both pitchers, the the Diamondbacks threw a uh, like three different guys, but all three guys early on ha- had were really EV efficient. And as a result, fastballs in, swing and miss, pop it up, foul tip, sliders away, ugly swings and misses, change ups down and in, ugly swings and misses. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're all playing checkers for the most part. Mm -hmm. And and I would say of all the teams in Major League Baseball, the one team that's playing advanced checkers, at least probably more than that, I know the hitting coach personally very, very well, and he's trying to play chess. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he's he's a high level chess player 
But sometimes it's hard to get that point, those points across at that highest level. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, But what I would say is this. Right now, anything works Mm -hmm. because you have random stuff going on, trying to get more spin. I'm throwing pitches that I don't care what the tunnel looks like as long as I get the right spin rate. And so as long as that's happening, there's a lot of pitches that are overlapping each other. Mm-hmm. So you're think of it, think of the speeds. This is the best analogy I know. All fastballs in are ones. <clears throat> All fastballs on that diagonal or away are twos. Mm-hmm. Hard, but they're they're they have less reaction time. All hard off speed pitches, cutters, hard changeups, splits that are that are faster. Those are all threes. Fours are soft off speed pitches, mainly in the big leagues, just curveball. Mm -hmm. So of all the pitches thrown in the big leagues, about 66% of them are twos and threes. And so all of the great hitters in Major League Baseball are guys that turn the barrel, get their barrel going down upward, and they're hitting twos. Their whole world is geared around hitting twos. And they run into threes (laughs) because Mm -hmm. threes show up in the middle. So they're on their way to the fastest pitch away and they run into this, the medium speed pitches here and the slower pitches up. So when you hang a curveball, or if you're obvious with the curveball and they see it, it it's, it times well with them loading, going, and then running into at the tail end, this pitch that's misplaced. And usually it's because they can see it out of your hands. The second you turn the corner and you stop making pitches obvious, the whole world changes because now they load, they see fastball, they go, they see fastball, they start their swing and it's fastball in. Mm -hmm. And now they're a mess because it's not a two, it's one, it's it's Mm -hmm. six or seven miles an hour faster than they expected and they get blown up or it's not a two, it's a three and a half because it looked like right down the central but then it 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 dove in a in a direction that was slowing it down, and now they swing over the top of it because it's nowhere near that speed range that they've geared their whole life towards. It's like a bubble. There's this bubble of speed that that Major League Baseball hits in, and as long as pitchers keep throwing a lot of pitches in that bubble, I don't care who what crazy philosophy you have, you're going to have some success. Now. Here's where here's where I'm at. How do you define success? Is hitting 220 with 25 jacks a successful season? Mm-hmm. I guess, right? I, if for Major League Baseball at the moment, that's league average kind of. And, and so league average is good. If you hit 240 with, with 25 jacks, 80 ribbies, you're a star. <laughs> you're making millions of dollars. One well, on on that too, uh, you know, one of the other pieces that I, I showed you from hitting guru number fifty seven, who's really upset that Major League Baseball is moving towards the the effects uh, OPS, right? Uh, well, not moving towards; they've been doing that, and then there's other metrics that they're really looking and 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 waiting their recruiting system on is hard hit rate and and uh, sweet spot percentage, right? And so this particular post from this instructor was uh, complaining that they were negative on um luck hits on the bloop singles and the cni singles and things like that and they were saying well you know i don't understand why mlb using these metrics you know poo poo metrics you know, who 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 uh, pays attention to metrics why <laughs> why they're punishing the hitter who gets these ugly hits right and so the the thing is is that we've all heard people listening to this watching this we've all heard on mlb central and and some of these guys online or whatever is that we need this barrel path that starts in the zone really really early so in case we're late we can we can hit it to opposite field and we need it to stay on plane as long as possible so that if we're early then we can pull it down the line and that's what you're talking about i think with these twos and threes is that barrel path works if pitchers stay within that round but what happens when they go ones and fours yes it's like every hitting thing you've ever heard on mlb network except for carlos Pena, every right. single one of them is all geared to the exact same thing Man, he's really good when he hits the ball the other way. When he hits that fastball right center, right-handed hitter, he's really on time. And the answer to that is, yes, if it's a two, but hell no, if it's a one, he's fighting that off and hitting it off his knuckles. Mm -hmm. Maybe it gets over the first baseman's head, but 
if I'm a pitcher, I'm okay with that. The, the question is, how do you define? And, and that's where I say that Major League Baseball has taken a dive. This last year was the fifth was the lowest batting average in 55 years. So is that good? Right? I mean, is that good? Is that okay? <laughs> is is the world of hitting okay with having the worst batting average in 55 years? And I know most people hate batting average, but it's still a big factor because it's the percentage of hits that you get. It's a met- it's a metric. It's a metric, right? Some of the hits are are off your knuckles and some of them are 100 100. But what my philosophy has always been is that if my goal is to be at 100 100 and I start measuring it so that I know that when Carlos Peña dips below 119 118 117 we got problems there's something mechanically not quite right or his timing's off or he's just missing the barrel for some reason because of some kind of weird thing going on in his in his mechanics so in order to keep everything flowing, <laughs> you have to be close to 100 in all these three really basic elements. And the reason that people hate some of these metrics is because, especially this metric, 100, 100, 100, mm-hmm. people hate this metric for two reasons. One, they feel like nobody could be that perfect and, and they're correct 100%. No one can be that perfect. It's just a measurement tool. It's designed to show you what max out is Mm -hmm. so that you know how close you are to your maximum. That's what the point of it is. Okay. Um, So that's a weird thing that people have a hard time getting past. Right. The other thing is, is that um, when you start measuring stuff, you start seeing that people hitters are not as good as you think you followed one hitter. And I would advise everybody to do this. Just pick your favorite hitter, go on to um, the search of baseball savant, And just punch that hitter in, select the hitter. And when you just hit whatever, uh, just just hit go, search, it'll bring up all their pitches all throughout the whole year. (laughs) So you can just go pitch by pitch by pitch by pitch. And you look at all the balls that they swung at. And you look at all the balls that they put in play and all the balls that they foul tip and all the balls that they swing and miss. And you will be shocked how poor the average hitter is, even the average superstar hitter is, at getting a pitch to hit and squaring it up. They're very poor at that in general. We think, man, every time you make a mistake, that guy punishes it. No, that's not what happens. Mm -hmm. Every time you make a mistake, middle, middle, they foul it off. They swing and miss. They pop it up. They swing up and catch the top of the ball and hit a weak ground ball. Mm -hmm. That's why they hate ground balls. Because when you swing up and you hit a ground ball, it's 80 miles an hour or less. And that batting average is 210. Mm -hmm. But when you go up, to and you start getting flatter then you start to see really hard ground balls so it shows flaws when you measure stuff that's the bottom line if you hold up a mirror and you don't like what you see well sorry it's just a mirror right Mm -hmm. the the to me statistics are simply that they're simply um what do you call it uh the symptoms of what's going on, not the disease. Yeah. It's just the symptom. It's showing you like you take a typical guy, like a, like a Votto, a two, a two strike approach Votto, Joey Votto. I did a big, long study one time that you, I think talked about at some point we talked about it. Mm -hmm. If you take fastballs in the heart of what should be hit out of the yard and you look at what he does with two strikes it's a ridiculous amount of foul tip, swing and miss, pop up, topper, just like awful results on these balls that should be hit out of the yard. And it's because of a, me- a mechanic and an approach combined mm-hmm. to, to put yourself into a not a great place to make solid contact on great pitches to hit. And so I just look at that whole of that and go, okay, Joey Votto La- loses – 50% of his slugging percentage, his batting average is, is under 200. With two strikes. So, that they, so you're talking about a uh, before and after where he decided he wanted to, what did he, he wanted to increase his batting average. Decrease by, strikeouts. Decrease strikeouts. That's what it decrease was. He strike, de- put the ball in play. Put the ball in play with two strikes. And so he made yeah. these adjustments. He made these specific physical adjustments right. to his two strike approach. So that's what you're talking about. Right. So and tons of people followed. There yeah. was a guy online 
this analytic guy online said God took a a, a break and came down and played Joey Votto with two strikes, some, <laughs> something to that effect. And I was like, oh my God. That, I mean, on multiple levels. But my <laughs> my thought was this. Is it worth it to have a few less strikeouts if in fact that's what's happening? Because I would even argue that. Mm -hmm. Because when you understand, when your timing is on and your swing plane is right and your uh, mechanical efficiency is right, which includes the swing plane. Um, when when that's right, you don't swing and miss hardly ever. Yeah. It's very rare that you swing and miss. Something has to happen where you just totally got fooled by the pitch, and that's going to happen. But by and large, strikeouts should go down. When I worked with Pena, his strikeouts went down 25%. Mm -hmm. That is ridiculously significant. Yeah. And his batting average went up 25%. So there was this flip flop of that. And he hit a homer every eight and a half at bats for that period of time. And I, and I think, I think that's what Vada was trying to shoot for, right? He, his whole thing was to do that experiment was to drop his strikeouts. Cause he, he believed that that was going to increase his batting average, but he did it in the wrong way. Now I did not look at what the effect of batting average was. Mm. I just looked at his two strike batting average mm -hmm. and his two strike batting average was under 200. Mm -hmm. And so is that good? And my answer to that is hell no, because <laughs> you should hit 450 in two yeah. strikes because guys are more predictable in 0212 counts than they are in 00 counts. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather face certain pitchers, big time pitchers. I did a study of, uh, in fact, it was one of the things that got me to convince Carlos Pena to, to start thinking differently. And that was, okay, you've got a guy that is um, Roger Clemens. In 02 counts, the study was um, the batting average was like 085. And when you look at what he does with two strikes, he's either going to A, elevate the fastball, or B, throw a slider away, down and away if you're a righty hitter. And then a split changeup kind of thing that nobody could ever define. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but it was a changeup that went down, right? And so of those pitches, He's only in the strike zone like 9% on one of the off speed and about 8 or 9% on the other one, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. Period, right? With two strikes in yep. the, in these counts. Right. So what is what is the of those three pitches, can you hit a slider in the dirt? Can you hit a split in the dirt? No. Can you hit a fastball that's up? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? <laughs> so if I'm if I'm in an 0-2 count against Clemens and I know that this is the this is what happens over time. This is what he does. Mm -hmm. What generally hitters do is they do what Votto did, shrink everything, get to the middle. So now you've allowed the pitcher to be able to beat you with his elevated fastball. Mm -hmm. Strike one, right? Like that's that's one thing against me. The other thing is, is I fall for everything that looks middle and then mm -hmm. falls off the planet. So I chase that slider in the dirt. I chase that split. I chase all that stuff. Now flip the script <laughs> and hmm. now I sit dead red top of the zone in 0-2 counts because I know he's not going to throw that slider in the strike zone. Mm -hmm. I'm daring him to throw that slider in the strike zone in, in essence. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I really wouldn't dare him to do anything. I mean, but, but I would humbly just say, I think this is what you're going to do because this is what you've done over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to sit dead red top of the zone. I'm going to add the right speed. I'm going to get flat. I'm not going to swing at it like this and, and hit one in 25. I'm going to swing at it like this and hit every, every single one of them. Almost. Mm -hmm. I'm hardly ever going to miss it. Cause my barrel's in line for a ridiculous amount of time on a pitch at the top of the zone. So how does that work out for me? I don't know. Maybe I hit 250, but I hit bombs. I'm going to hit doubles. I'm going to do damage because I'm a hundred percent on time to something that, that, Joey Votto's philosophy, and I'm not knocking him because I, I I really like him actually. Yeah, I do too. Um, it his that philosophy is ludicrous mm -hmm. because it plays right mm -hmm. into that hand. You are putting yourself in a place where you're going to chase the most obvious off speed pitches that were that are designed to make you chase, and you're not going to handle the one pitch you can hit. Mm -hmm. It's like yep. the dumbest thing ever, right? Like right. if you really look at it from an analytic standpoint. What do the numbers say? The numbers say that taking your swing and calming it down and bringing it to the middle 
and being passive is the the absolute worst thing that you can do. It does to, not cut down strikeouts. And to fight stuff off, I think I remember Joey Votto was part of it. You know, hey, if it's not there, then just fight it off. Keep fighting it off. Keep fighting yeah. it off. Keep fighting. But uh, how many hitters that you and I work with, these young kids, how many of them are as good as a Joey Votto or a Mike Trout to be able to do that, to fight well, something first off? off? First off, I almost I want to cuss really bad <laughs> because – if you tell me that Joey Votto is fouling that ball off on purpose, purpose. I will tell you that you are absolutely crazy. <laughs> and because what are you waiting for? That pitch yeah. is right down the middle. Right. It's a fastball center cut and you're spoiling it. Yeah. I don't understand that <laughs> methodology. Uh, are you waiting for a better pitch? I know. What are you waiting for? <laughs> uh, it, it, that, that, that argument is such nonsense mm -hmm. because Nobody fouls a ball on purpose unless you're like it's inside and you're like, boom, I know I'm going to pull that way foul and I smash it. Mm -hmm. That's done on purpose. This right. nonsense of going like this and just touching a ball to get it to foul off. You're not fouling that off on purpose. You're, you're trying to hit it, but you're failing and you're failing because you're not in line with the pitch. So the odds of you ever hitting it solid are virtually nil. Carlos started a thing recently that I love. It's like every time you swing the bat, instead of like giving you credit when you hit it hard, I'm going to take all of your swings <laughs> and then give you a hard hit ball rate based mm -hmm. on how many swings and misses, foul tips, mm -hmm. all that combined yeah. mm -hmm. into a, how, when you swing the bat, how often do you get a hard hit ball? Mm -hmm. And that starts to show more realistically what, a hitter how good a hitter is at the last 100 at squaring the ball up and because and it and this goes straight straight to the point of we talked about this on the on part one but the fact that we have a ball especially an elevated fastball coming down at two to three mile two to three degrees you have these swings by hitting guru number 57 who's teaching this this snap early in the zone snap early so when you snap early what happens is that barrel leaves the shoulder once a barrel leaves the shoulder, you have less control over that barrel. So that the force is centrifugal, centripetal, whatever you start, you lose that barrel away from the body as you're turning. So the odds of you being able to get back to flat of the, of the ball coming down at two to three degrees is ni almost nil, almost impossible. So once that snap happens, barrel goes in the zone early, you're swinging up from there. And a lot of these hitters are swinging 15, 20, 25 degrees up. So you have a pitch coming down at two to three degrees. you got a barrel coming up at 15 to 25 <laughs> degrees, depending on, right? So I don't care if you have a high T drill that you do to hit the high pitch. The ball's on a T at one spot. Of course, you're going to hit that pitch on a T. But when you got a ball coming in two to three degrees down up in the zone and you got a 15 to 25 degree angle coming up of the barrel. It's not going to happen. Like Perry says, one in 25, if you're lucky. Yeah. One in 25. It's closer to one in 50. <laughs> it's closer to the one number in keeps 50. going up. Every time we talk about this, Perry, I, know. Keeps... <laughs> I would tell you that if, if you, if you put me to the test, I would say that this swing plane, and I'm, I'm not talking about everybody's swing plane. Yeah. I'm talking about this severe swing plane, trying to hit a ball that's going up. And I'll give you a real life example. In the postseason last year, Justin Verlander threw 21 fastballs or 22 to uh, Bryce Harper. He he put one ball in play. Now he didn't swing at all 22, but he swung at a lot of them, probably 12 or 13, and foul tipped or swung and missed on every elevated fastball. Mm -hmm. And then finally, when the ball was lower, hit it matched his barrel easier, and he squares one up. Right, like the homer that he hit that Harper hit against. Uh, the Padres that ruined their season or that made the Philly season. Mm -hmm. That was the fifth fastball in that sequence. He had fouled off, swung on and missed like three or four other fastballs. They were all faster than that one, all flatter than that one. Mm -hmm. And then here comes one middle away that matches his bat path. Mm -hmm. And that happens to be slower. And that he had four or five other pitches to acclimate himself to that speed range. Mm -hmm. Right. And then adjust to that speed range. In fact, if you overlay those some of those swings, what you would find is they're exactly the same. Only one of them matches the bat and the other one doesn't. <laughs> so it's is it is it him adjusting or is it the pitcher adjusting slightly with speeds and location in order to match his bat path better? And mm -hmm. I would tell you, if you knew the truth to that, you would be shocked at how often it's the latter. It's the pitcher. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. hitting the bat and not the batter. Because mm-hmm. the second it goes away, the second you take that flat fastball at the bottom of the zone or that downward flat, the downward fastball that matches their upward swing plane, the second that goes away, do they still hit? Answer, no, they do not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when they only get fastballs up, some can adjust, but some do not. Some will just fight that off, swing at it like this, and just say, I've heard lots of hitters say, I'll just tip my hat if the guy can throw three pitches there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> that's how Trevor Bauer blew people up was, okay, strike one, here's strike two. And now let's see what you're going to get for strike three. Is it going to mm-hmm. be what you expect? Probably not. It's going to look like this, and then it's going to go this way or this way or mm-hmm. whatever. But when when you understand the game you're playing, right now the world's playing checkers. They're playing a very bad form of chess where it's random as hell. Mm-hmm. So anything can work. And so who wins at the end of the year? The ones with the, the, the most talented horses. Mm-hmm. The ones with the, the, the strongest horses wins the race. It's that simple. Right. But the second the, the philosophy starts to change in one or two groups, and that's what's happening with Oklahoma and softball. Mm-hmm. They're just playing a much higher, more intellectual game of chess than everybody else. They're flatter. They're more on time. They're not trying to hit homers necessarily. They're trying to swing in an area that creates the most, the hardest contact, period. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to avoid ground balls and hit fly balls. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to do any of that. I'm trying to square up the ball. I'm trying to be 100% on time with my 100% most efficient swing. Mm-hmm. And if you don't measure that, how the hell do you know if you're getting any better? Right? If you're just standing up there like a like a typical Aaron Judge homer on a fastball middle in that he that he contorts his body to hit inside out and hits the ball the other way. And it scrapes the back of the shortest fence in the world. (laughs) And he gets a homer. Bravo. That's brilliant. You're playing to your field. You're doing all kinds of cool stuff, right? I don't want to take anything away from that, but how far away from 100 are you? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, as long as it goes out of the yard, who cares? The question is how often does it go out of the yard compared to how often it's a squibber or foul tip or pop-up or, you know, that rollover ground ball. Because that's what happens for real when you swing like this is you look at the overall body of work and you see a lot of balls, more balls up than normal. Mm-hmm. Because the science says that 40% of the round ball, round bat contact is going to go up and 40% is going to go down and 20% is going to go along that line that you're swinging in general, if you're Mm -hmm. on time. Mm -hmm. But when you start doing this and this, like a speedboat going across the top of the water and you're down, you're going to try to shoot a torpedo at this thing Mm -hmm. going upward, Mm -hmm. right? Versus being up on the same plane as the boat and he's coming right at you and you shoot (laughs) that torpedo. What do you think the odds of you missing are, right? Right. That's what we're talking about is we're talking about trying to hit a speedboat with a torpedo Mm -hmm. that, You got a one in 50 chance, one in 25 chance. Sure, you're going to foul tip it. Sure, you're going to pop it up, top it, whatever. Sure, every once in a while, you're going to hit one out, but it's about one in 25. It's not one in two. Yeah. Well, I I think Carlos Pena is on to something. I I would just wonder what would happen if they created a metric that was taking all swings and had a batting average of hard hit rate, fair balls, hard hit rate, all swings, foul balls, swings and misses, the whole thing, and and had a, a batting average or whatever they want to call it. Uh, I wonder what happened to a lot of the teaching. If they if they heavy weighted that on on who their recruits are going to be, um, what do you think would happen to this game if they did that? <laughs> well, well, here's what I know is going to happen to this game. I can <laughs> promise you this is what's going to happen to this game. Mm-hmm. Pitching is going to wake up. They're going to stop listening to the, the whoever gurus out there on the other side of the coin. That are telling them to get more over here and and bring back a, a sweeper that was thrown out of the game long time ago because it's stupid when you have a black belt hitter. Yeah, that's a thank you if you have yeah. a black belt hitter. So if you've got if you've got a pitcher that has this arm angle and he goes down here to throw this sweeper, right? 
because that's what has to happen mm-hmm. to, in order to get that sideways spin. Yeah, real. Yep. That's what he, that's what has to happen. Mm-hmm. So now you're going to show me two different arm angles, right? Mm-hmm. And two different pitches. Yep. And you think guys aren't going to catch on to that? Yep. Um, and and the fact that this thing is moving 18 inches now, mm-hmm. that means that it starts to move earlier. So if I sit dead red inside and and the second this thing starts to move away, it becomes an easier take, even if it has a good tunnel. Yeah. Because it's impossible to keep a 16 inch movement uh, pitch in the strike zone with another pitch that's moving 20 inches the other direction or 16 inches or eight inches. Mm-hmm. You can't throw a strike, both that are going to hide in the strike zone in a tunnel if if they both have gigantic movement, it, it can't be done. So that's advantage me, black belt hitter, right? Mm. But it doesn't mean anything to the white belt hitter because the white belt hitter is going to stand up there and squeeze everything to the middle because he wants to be really good at not only swinging at balls in the strike zone. Mm-hmm. So he becomes very unaggressive and very easy to throw a pitch, right? And they're going to chase it all day long. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I, again, I keep pointing to Oklahoma because they're the only ones that have actually put it into play. And and so what happens in that case? Keep going, Perry. I can hear you. There we go. No. Do they? Uh, no, they lead the world in walks. Why? Yeah. Because these are not good pressure pitches these are pitches that will be easier to take so the philosophy uh, until this is such a hard conversation because it's Mm multi-level it's three levels three different levels that we're talking about all the gurus out there are arguing about swing mechanics and swing mechanics is like it's like the it's like the abcs of hitting Mm -hmm. yes it's important But and no, you haven't gotten it right because if you did, guys would hit 350, not 220 and strike out 150 times. No, or in high school, or in high school, hitting 500, 600, and 700. Exactly, exactly, with 12 bombs, Mm -hmm. yeah, (laughs) and one or two or four strikeouts. Mm -hmm. Not, not I'm gonna strike out 40 times and hit eight bombs, right? Big deal. Right? 250 yeah yeah so so my first thing is what do you call good and i know we're talking about major league players but i also know that i've seen major league players do ridiculous stuff for long periods of time um in the sense that we saw cody bellinger add 150 points to his batting average or whatever in one year yeah. right now he's not firing on all cylinders But he has adjusted one simple fact. He's gotten less of that and more of that. Mm -hmm. Period. End of discussion. That's the only thing he's changed. Yeah, mechanics look the same. Right. He's still still a green belt. Mm -hmm. When it comes to philosophy, has no idea how. I mean, he's got a guessing plan that's pretty good. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. He sits on a pitch. When he gets it, he's golden. Mm -hmm. And when he's not, he's off time. But mm-hmm. he's gotten flatter, so when you're off time and you're flatter, guess what? You get some gore hits off your knuckles, and and so is that that to me that's part of your plan if you've got a great swing. Well, talk about what you you and I we talked last couple of weeks. We've been talking a lot, um, and not on on uh, camera like this. But one of the things we were you were talking you brought up was the fact that when you watch MLB Central and you tell them or you listen to them and they're saying he stays on plane really really well. Our question is, after watching what they're seeing, you and I are scr- left scratching our heads. What does he mean by on plane? So talk yeah. about, talk about talk <laughs> about your question on that. <laughs> I I feel stupid. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> I feel really stupid <laughs> because for years now, I've been thinking that all of these guys doing this high finish, all of this kind of stuff. And they keep talking about being on plane, on plane, on plane, on plane, on plane. This gets you more on plane. Throwing the barrel down like this gets you on plane. And I'm like, on plane to what? What are you (laughs) talking about? Are you talking about getting on plane to the pitch? Because that's the only plane that matters when it comes to contact. 
So this hundred, the quality of contact hundred is virtually at zero when you're doing this, trying to shoot your torpedo at a speedboat on top of the, <laughs> you know, unless mm -hmm. it's perfectly timed, you're missing. You're going to be late or early mm -hmm. a multitude of times before you're right on time. And, and that's what we're, that's what you're dealing with. So it hit me one day. I, wa I was watching something on the internet and I saw the instructor talking about, see this, see how she stays on plane, even after contact. <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh man, wait, you mean, wait a minute, the ball's going this way. The barrel's you going mean this way. That and you're talking she <laughs> is on plane to the hit that she wants <laughs> or the hit that the player wants or the barrel plane that they want. Well, they're trying to they're trying to mimic where they want the ball to go. In other words, they're on plane to where the highest production is in Major League Baseball, which is around 30 20, to 30 35 degrees, degrees. Uh -huh. at 100 miles an hour, right? So if you aim up and you catch the ball in that plane, so in other words, you're trying to guarantee that every time you hit a ball solid, it's going to be in that plane. Mm. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks, like what? <laughs> Are you, and you sold that to all of Major League Baseball? Oh my God, that's the greatest sales job in the history. It's the same of boat. Sales. It's the same speedboat with the torpedo going this way. The same thing, but except that they torpedoes think, aimed at at whatever twenty five degrees, thirty degrees. But they're yeah, but they're looking for that torpedo to 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 go in a, to hit it in a certain direction as it as it goes past. And it. It, it's even like this. It has to hit that speedboat in the perfect place, yeah. not just hit the speedboat. Because if you hit the tail end of the speedboat, yeah. you pop that ball up or yeah. or foul tipped it. Yep. Yeah. Right. And and that's what I'm talking about is how many good pitches to get do you get in a typical at bat in the mm -hmm. big leagues? Mm -hmm. You know, typically one or maybe two. Yeah. And in the case of, of Bryce Harper hitting that homer against the Padres, he got five really mm -hmm. great pitches to hit. Mm -hmm. And he fouled off, foul tip. If I'm pitching, or an EV efficient somebody is pitching, he gets one of those. And if you foul tip it or swing and miss on it, you're going to get four more that look just like it, but they're going somewhere other than that down and away area that allows you to catch up to it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the speedboat is moving into the mm -hmm. area where the, it's almost like they they coordinated with each other. They're heat seekers. Heat seekers. Yeah. It's speed that starts to, oh, well, well, speed it up, speed it up. Yeah. Or it's or it's uh, going to be two and it's, oh, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. <laughs> I, I, I say this every time and I know how stupid it sounds. I know how crazy <laughs> it sounds. How uh, out there, tin hat, you know, whatever, aluminum mm. hat. Yeah. But hitting in today's world right now in the major leagues, is more about the pitcher than it is about the hitter. The hitter is doing very little. And I can show you 10,000 examples of really great hitters getting killed on EV efficient sequences because they're not gearing for it for that. Their entire thought process is based around this speed bubble. They're all hitting twos and threes. They're, they're, they have designed their swings around twos and threes. What happens when pitchers wake up and that that creek dries up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no more twos and threes swimming around. Well, and think about this, Perry. So that this year, the Major League Baseball, because they keep trying to figure out how to increase offensive production. So it's do we bring the fences in? Do we lower the mounds? Do we take the seams off the ball and just have them throw a, a smooth cowhide leather, you know? Um, and this year they instituted the clock, which I, I actually like. I like the clock, uh, the 20 second thing or whatever. Um, they instituted bigger bases. So be, guys are stealing bases, things like that. Um, so some of the things that they did, I mean, they're, it's cool. That's great. But I, I think, I think the main problem is that, like you said, the hitters are getting worse. And if the pit, pitchers get getting even worse better, because we keep changing the rules to help them. Yes. They're Instead of forcing them to have to get better on their own to stop listening to to the people out there in the world that are teaching this nonsensical but they keep stuff. listening to them. they keep listening to them so then the, it, it, they have to keep capitulating and keep handicapping the, well, this the is what i said earlier i said here's what i know is going to happen is the pitching is going to get so good really soon that the hitters are going to have no choice because hitting mm -hmm. is going to really really fall mm -hmm. hard 
because every swing's geared to twos and threes. Efficient <laughs> pitching really slows down and almost completely eliminates twos mm -hmm. where the whole swing is geared to a two. Mm -hmm. Like the whole world of a hitter is geared towards hitting twos. That's why this is designed so that you can get underneath a low pitch mm -hmm. and hit it out, a low fastball. It's yeah. the only purpose for that. Yeah. Now, they don't realize that they're giving up the entire top two-thirds of the strike zone in order to do that <laughs> when it comes to fastballs, but that's the trade-off that they're making. Yeah. Yes, they're hitting, they're getting underneath this, but like a, a player that's doing, has the right approach is not lifting that ball. They're lifting this ball. Mm -hmm. This ball's lifting itself, I should say. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're crushing the top two-thirds of the zone, and they're hitting 420 on the bottom part of the zone. But they're not doing it with homers. They're doing it with low, screaming, hard ground balls that carry a really high batting average. Mm -hmm. so they're maxing out every part of the zone by not being ludicrous, not being based on this nonsensical idea. It's not that that, that they're wrong, that all the production is up there. It's how do you get there? Yeah. You don't get there by aiming there and going up. Well, consistently and that was the part that hit me. God, consistently, I felt, I felt so stupid after that. Like, like all this time, you guys have been talking about staying on the plane of the ball you want to hit. Uh huh. And I thought you were talking about. I thought this, in some weird way, I thought they meant they're on plane with the pitch. Mm -hmm. Like, oh. <laughs> Well, and, and, and I only have maybe about five minutes here because um, we could go on and on and on. Um, but I wanted to, we talked about a little, or talked a little bit about Corey Seager. He's on the Texas Rangers. And like you said, uh, Tim Hires is over there, um, man in that ship. And and you're good, you know, pretty close connected. He's, like you said, he's a black belt on the hitting side, playing chess and, and stuff like that. And so Corey leaving uh, the Dodgers and going over to the Rangers, I, I, I before even talking to you, I was watching highlights and I see him smash a ball like a 98 mile an hour fastball yeah. up in the zone. And I saw how flat his barrel was or how on plane of the pitch he was. And I was like, I, I think Noah was there too. I go, Noah, check that out, dude. He, that something's changed in his swing. Cause he's not swinging under now. Um, and he wasn't as bad as Bellinger for those like three or four years right. that he couldn't hit his weight. Um, but um, he, he, he was a little flatter than Bellinger, I think, but now it's like there, there has been a hundred percent dramatic change in Corey Seager. Yeah. Well, I would just say, I mean, I, I, I know everybody says he's healthy. Okay. Granted, uh, I'm not, not going to ever take anything away from that. Yeah. Yeah. But um, his, his swing plane is a little bit flatter. It's still not where I think yeah. it should be, mm -hmm. but who am I? I mean, he's, he's the guy that is one of the few guys at the end of every year, how many guys are hitting 300? <laughs> you know, you look, that list is getting shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. It used to be 20 guys at the top hitting 300. Now it's like four. There's yeah. Three or four. And all the rest, nope. You know, it's it goes down very significantly fast, mm -hmm. except for a few teams. Mm -hmm. There are teams and, and guys mixed in. And there's teams that I can see starting to do some things right. Like they're hitting on one cylinder. And that's what's happening with those guys is they're they're hitting twos and and uh they're they're catching like what I would say 1.5s. They're mm -hmm. hitting 1.5s pretty good. And that's what their offense is is has done better than everybody else. Same thing with the Rays, same thing with some other clubs that are starting to bump it up. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the examples that I had was was a swing path that is so in line, can't miss it. And that's what's that's what's creating more of that hard contact, not missing as many pitches, getting more solid ground balls along with those balls that leave the yard because they're the same. Mm -hmm. You hit a rocket ground ball and you hit a ball that goes 400 feet. They're the same. It's just that I was quarter of quarter of an inch lower on one than the other. Right. And I can't control that. I mean, if I took this bat and I grabbed a ball and literally just tried to hit them like that see i got over the center of that <laughs> that ball right there right i couldn't hit the middle of this two middles <laughs> if i was this far away yeah it's impossible yeah. no matter what happens you're going to be underneath 40 percent roughly and over 40 percent mm -hmm. and the second people realize that they realize that that 
that perfect ball that they're talking about doesn't happen by this. Yeah. <laughs> it happens by this. Shooting torpedoes from below. Yes. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing, man? It's well, a cool. happy accident. Well, well let, let's end on that. I know we promised people that you're going to do some, um, we even set it up so that Perry could control the screen and do it. <laughs> but part three, for sure. We'll, we'll do a part three next week for sure. And, and we'll do just we have time for one. Yeah, let's do one. Let's do one. Let's do one. Cause I, couple, I don't want to lie. To yeah. <laughs> let me see if I can find uh... we'll do it the whole time in part three. We'll do that. How about that? Yeah. We'll start with this and, and not leave it. Oh, here we go. It's all queued up. Can we see this? Uh, share it. So share whatever where whatever that screen is. There you go. Have I shared it? Yep. Okay. I got to move my little uh, thing out of the way. All right. So you see this ball coming in, and let me let me put a, a little line on it so we can see what the angle is. So I'll go back here. And we put a line on that pitch straight through it. And that's pretty accurate, right? Four, four degrees down, yep. Okay. So now, and first off, this hitter should be fine because he's swinging down to get to this line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so according to almost everybody in the world, that's terrible. You can't do that. <laughs> but he swings down to get to that line. And then he swings what? Did he lift? <laughs> to get to that and the answer is no yeah. he stayed in line with it and got underneath it on purpose no this is where he thinks he's going to hit the ball and how do you know that is because their hand-eye coordination is amazing mm -hmm. where's his focus it's out here mm -hmm. where's his arm get extended out here mm -hmm. when this line when that barrel passes through this line this pitch line that's when they think they're going to hit it so where does he actually hit it? He hits it back here, mm -hmm. right? And so he's that late to that yeah. pitch. Right. And this is a wall scraper uh, to right field, okay? Mm -hmm. If we show you, if I show you this, this is the, the actual ball. So this is an outside pitch, up and mm -hmm. away. 95. Yep. Hits it out, barely gets out, three or four rows deep. But again, it's impressive, right? Mm -hmm. But it looks like he's all over this and he crushes this. If he crushed it, if this human being crushed mm. a ball, it goes 480. It doesn't go 312 or whatever that right field fence is there. It's this. It's, it's the idea of understanding all these stupid lines. Mm -hmm. This is a miss hit and it's not a... It's a really good miss hit, but it's a miss hit because right there is where he was supposed to hit it. Right mm -hmm. here is where he hits it. It leaves, it's a 28 degree miss, right? Mm -hmm. But it's deflecting, it's deflection rate is like, if, if that's a, a term that's accurate, is he's 28 degrees away from the perfect line. Mm -hmm. But that's a happy accident. It's brilliant. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's about what he's probably about a foot missing it about a, a foot from where he should have been at hundred. I would say it's more than that. I would say he needs to be two feet out here. I'd say it's, I'd say it's one time unit uh -huh. so in, in EV terms, a time unit. Like if that 95 fastball wasn't located up and away, because up and away is the same reaction time as middle, middle Yep. and down and in, they all have the mm -hmm. same reaction time. Right. So when you move that over six inches, it changes the reaction time to where like, right. Instead of having to make contact there, he would have to make contact out there. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Right. right so right, this right. is, this is him. This is where he needs to make contact for that pitch to be perfect. Mm -hmm. To hit the ball that was up and in, it would be all the way out here. Right. Right. So all we're doing is we're talking about time. What's mm -hmm. the perfect timing? Well, he was late by about three miles an hour. Mm -hmm. That's typically what happens. That's why the highest exit velocity every single year, year in and year out, if we're talking about a right-handed batter, and this is my right-handed batter, <laughs> mm -hmm. every single year, whoops, I got them backwards. Um, sorry. The right-handed batter 
if we put the, the line in, and then we put this line in, every single year since they've started this process, this and this and this are the highest exit velocity on fastballs every single year. Mm -hmm. Why? Because those are three miles an hour slower than middle middle. So the average speed in the big leagues is 93. That's the average fastball. That's also the average exit velocity on in these three locations. Mm. Why? Because they're three miles an hour late. And so they hit it with less energy. This is 96. This is 96. This is 96. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they hit the fastball that's away harder, the hardest. This is the hardest hit ball is a little bit away from this ball that's on this diagonal. Why? Because they're late. They're this right here. They're, this is the explanation mm -hmm. is that he's a couple miles an hour, three miles an hour late. So he ends up hitting this ball harder than he would hit it if it was in the middle. It, does that make sense to you? Yep. Uh huh. So in other words, the hitter's brain, they're working in the past a little bit and they're always just a tiny bit late until I get a couple of these and then I can adjust my time, my inner sense of timing. But right now this guy is late. And why am I pointing that out and making a big deal about it is because if he, if he realizes that he's late, the next time he won't be as late, right? We can make adjustments off of that every single at bat mm -hmm. to get to a point where we're more and more closer and closer to inching down to that perfect 100 on time thing. But is this miss pretty good? <laughs> yes. Pretty dang good. Yep. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. the question is, is how good do you miss? And the answer is when your swing plane is right, you miss really well. Mm -hmm. A lot. Mm -hmm. You can be early or late and still crush this. He could hit this all the way back here. And now, you, now, now, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Here. Mm -hmm. Or here. Or here. Or here. Or all of those are in line with that pitch. They're on plane to that plane, the pitch plane. Now, what's That's what's the part that people are just completely missing the boat on? Here's the million dollar question going back to the boat you just said. What happens if this guy was shooting torpedoes from below? What happens to this ball right here? Well, let's just take a look. <laughs> and we'll do last one and we'll button up this this part two. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll line up a bunch of these to show you. Mm -hmm. But one of these things about staying on the back foot and creating this tilt, creating mm -hmm. this angle – and swinging up like this, and this is not a great example. This is a slider, I think. Yeah. But it shows what the downside of staying back, creating that reverse C thing, swinging up, 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 up. Mm -hmm. Now you're you're more in line to a curveball. That's great. You're in line to that pitch. But and you 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 see how flat the barrel is down there at the bottom of the zone. Mm -hmm. So there's a period right down here where he's actually kind of flat. That's the one pro to this methodology is that on low pitches, you get this little area where you're actually kind of in line with it for a bit. That's mm -hmm. why they crush low fastballs. Yeah. But then it starts to come up and out of that line. So when their timing is off, they're done. They top it, they swing and miss, they foul tip it. And so you can add all kinds of data. You can look at however much data you want that year that Joey Votto, we're talking about pitches that were right here, belt high, middle in, Middle, middle, middle up and up and in, like the inner quadrant of the zone. Mm -hmm. There was like 270 of them, all fouled off, swung on and missed, or hit weakly. Or, or they turned in, you know, maybe turned into a, a ball that was put in play. But right. there was 270 balls that were not squared up, that were just passed on. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like – you're missing the entirety of the, of the process of how do you stop striking out? You don't stop striking out by cutting your swing down and trying to take advantage of things like this. Cause every time hitters pull their hands in and try to gain time by letting the ball get deeper back here, you're losing all this time. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'll show, I'll line up a bunch of fastballs to show you what I'm talking about. And I'll, I'll get some at bats where you just see, like the at bat, I have every swing of the at bat that Harper hit the homer. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I can show you foul tip, foul tip, swing and miss, swing and miss, swing and miss. Foul tip, getting a little closer as the ball gets lower. And then Mm -hmm. now the ball gets lower. And you overlay (laughs) those two swings and you go, they're the exact same swing. (laughs) Only the ball keeps moving into into the barrel. Right. (laughs) And that happens so often. And And honest to goodness, I'm not trying to take anything away from the hitters. Right. I'm they're they're obviously super ridiculously talented it's it's a question of the philosophy that mm-hmm. philosophy has some major flaws that pitchers have not taken advantage of yet that's what's going to change the game is when pitchers take advantage and, and like right now hitting pitching is above hitting like this much normally it stays just a little bit above guys used to hit 280 270 teams now the rangers hit to 280 right around there Everybody else, you know, the couple teams are close to that, but by and large, they're 230, 240. So realistically, hitting pitching is above hitting by like this much right now. Where it should be, mm. it's like this much mm-hmm. because the swings have gone down in quality and the approach has gone down to ridiculous place. And and so as a result of those two things. Hitting is in gigantic trouble the second pitchers wake up. Right. The second pitchers stop just throwing a bunch of fish into the barrel for guys to just swing <laughs> and yeah. run into balls. The second that changes, you're going to see a very ugly dip in offense. Crazy. Well, Perry, thanks again, man, for for sharing today. And we'll do a part three. And I promise we'll just do we'll just let Perry do his thing on on the videos on the next part on the part three. Uh, <laughs> anywhere people, if they want to reach out, Perry, where where can they find you? Uh, I'm going to start doing more and more stuff on YouTube. So you can uh, I don't even know what my YouTube thing is. I'll, I'll have to. I think people that. just put effective lossy Perry yeah. husband or EV Perry husband probably could find you on YouTube. But I'm going to start doing a lot of stuff on Twitter at, at EV Perry husband. Yeah, you'll, you'll cool. see a bunch of this kind of stuff. And effectivevelocity.com if they want yeah. to come check Wait, you out I want, there. I want to do one more because I, I have it queued up. Okay. And it's it it tells the story better than anything I could say. This pitch is top of the zone at uh I can't remember the speed of this pitch, but it's pretty quick. It's it's like the equivalent of 96, 97. Mm-hmm. And she is directly in line. I don't know if you could say that there's it's it's really close to 100%. Mm-hmm. This was the second hardest hit ball in all of the College World Series. And I have the first one too. I'll show you next time. Mm-hmm. But this one was the hardest. This ball went so like uh maybe 20 feet off the ground and left the yard. It was I think 82 or 83 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. But look at the look at the little numbers over here. 0 degrees. Mm-hmm. That's where this ball is at. Yep. Her barrel is zero degrees, basically. Mm-hmm. Her goal is to hit it at 10. Mm-hmm. And she hits it at 15. So she's virtually perfect with hitting this ball. And this almost never happens. But this is the goal every time. This just happens to be one of the one of the closest to perfect that actually turned into uh, a rocket fly ball. In general... A lot of these minus 10, a lot of these at 30 where the ball carries 40 or 50 feet over the fence. But if the goal is this, guess what? My miss hits are in this 40% Mm -hmm. and my miss hits over are in this 40%. But it happens as a result of this. We call it hitting back through the tube. So the ball comes in through the tube, you hit it back through the tube. That's where she's trying to get to. Yep. And she's not off her backside completely. So mm-hmm. there, there's a couple tiny little ridiculous anal flaws that are keeping her from the hardest hit ball she's ever hit. Mm-hmm. But it's so close, the whole picture, that that's the result of what happens when you are when you start measuring to that degree. And I'll tell you a story next time about um, about right now. Remind me of that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and a real life example of that with softball again. Mm-hmm. But that's the answer right there. You see how where this thing goes? It's ridiculous. <laughs> well, but cool. It's not, a... it's not perfect, but it's as close as almost physically you can get. To mm-hmm. We're just it's it's the pursuit of perfect. 
right that right. that lets you fall short and still be superstar very cool that's a good teaser for the next one so thanks again perry for for coming on today and we'll look forward to part three all right awesome all right let me The Hitting Performance Lab wants to know, did you know repeatable hitting power does not start in the hips? Have you heard the expressions, load and explode the hips, power comes from the hips? Well, we created a free video revealing the results of a scientific study that will show you how we added 48 feet of batted ball distance instantly, and it's not all about the hips. Click here now to get the video while it's still free.